Hello, and thank you for joining the Alternate and Historical Fiction Tracks panel celebrating 35 years of American Girl. I'm Allison Helfrick, and I'll be moderating this panel. I have joining me Terry Parker, Katie Lovely, and Rachel Kays. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Good to be here. So first, I want to kind of address the elephant in the room as Katie and Rachel are both cosplaying ladies from American Girl. Uh, Katie, Rachel, do you want to talk about who you're cosplaying and kind of what drew you to those specific characters? Go ahead, Rachel. So I'm Felicity, uh, and she was my favorite American Girl growing up. Uh, she was the first doll I got. And mostly, you know, clearly the red hair, that's a big connection to her. And I loved how much she loved horses and how much she went on adventures and uh, especially breaking up spy rings and things like that. I just thought that was so cool. And so um, because I've loved her for such a long time, um, I always like, I would see in the American Girl catalogs um, from my older sister when she had them that they used to make the matching dresses for the dolls, but that was a little bit before my time. And I always wanted one. So finally, it was, I think two years ago, um, I saw another cosplayer had made a historically accurate Felicity and she had commissioned the fabric for it. So I was like, this is my chance. <laughs> I can finally have it. So um, I made mine as closely to the doll as I could. And it just, it makes me very happy. <laughs> Well, it's beautiful. Um, Thank you. Felicity also was one of my favorite American girls because uh, I also am a horse girl. But today I'm dressed as Josefina um, and um, I do living history. So I do a lot of stuff with like museums and historic sites. And so I did kind of a historical interpretation for mine. So my fabric isn't an exact match to the Felicity doll, but it's a reproduction print that really reminded me of her dress and it fits in with, she's 1824. Um, and it fits in a lot with some of the really wild, cool prints that you see from that time. Um, and I made it as a dress that I could wear as I'm, I'm an adult woman um, and you know, she's a nine-year-old girl. So I made it something that I could wear as an adult woman, but in the style of the, the Josefina dress. So it's a little bit different take. Um, like, I love that you made a dress like as close to the doll as possible. And there's so much room for creativity within that kind of American girl space so that people can make it fit them and how they relate to the dolls and the history and all of that. Yeah, I absolutely love that creativity that gets put into it, like with the reproduction fabric, because I am such a history nerd. Like, I absolutely love that that's the details you latched on to. And I've loved seeing the takes on like aging them up, like what would they look like in the next decade or... Um, just all the different cre creative approaches people can take through yeah, that historical I'm actually, avenue. I'm actually friends with the lady who commissioned the fabric. So Heather Hoffman, um, she did the like the historically accurate versions and she also is now grown. Mm -hmm. So she did like a woman's dress rather than a girl's dress. So it was really mm -hmm. fun to see the kind of very clear Felicity aesthetic for someone who grew up with that yes. as part of their like formative years. I really, really loved that too. I think that's great. Well, that um, begs the question in my mind, uh, bloomers or no? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually wearing leggings right now because I'm in my basement and it's cold. But when I do historical stuff, the, the bloomers are, are very, very comfortable and very useful. Nice. I usually go without, but I usually, I, I sneak in the historical inaccurate biking shorts, so. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Especially if you're still at conventions. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and if I know I'm gonna be changing in a parking lot later, I will be wearing <laughs> the, the shorts or leggings underneath. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I was just thinking, are the costumes comfortable enough to go a full length of a day? Oh yeah, I, I do all the time. Nice. Absolutely, I try to, when I can, uh, integrate my comfort into my costumes as much as possible and make them very practical. 
So no stays in the Felicity. <laughs> oh, I'm wearing stays. I actually, I do have stays. They're yeah, just they custom made to me. So they're very comfortable. Exactly. And I'm, I'm wearing stays as well. And like, I don't know if you can hear that. That's <laughs> yeah. yep. down the front of my stays right here. Um, but again, like they're, they're well fitted and, um, I'm, I'm a lady of size. Um, and so I don't have any weight hanging from my shoulders when I'm wearing stays. So for me, it's great back support. Like I'm old now, right? I, I grew up with the early American girls. Um, and it, it, it distributes things in a nice, comfortable way. Nice. That's and then nice. I opted for a half boned corset. So it has a little bit more flexibility, not corset stays, but it has that, that flexibility to it. Um, so it, it still has the structure, but it's also has that ease for, for comfort. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. And I mean, you have to think these are all based on historical fashion. Our ancestors wore these 24 seven. And so through living history, one of the things that I've learned is that they knew what they were doing. Like it's different than how we define comfort today. So like, yeah, obviously I love sweatpants and slouchy shirts and sitting on my couch watching Netflix, but you know, they were, they were living in a different world. And so they made clothing that offered them what they needed. So like the back support and the, the breathability, they didn't have indoor, you know, temperature control, right? So yeah. a lot of natural fibers, breathable clothing, um, support for, you know, different uh, tasks throughout the day, all of that. So I, I do really like that that element of, it's different comfort than what we know now, but it is very adaptable. So if you are wanting to dress like an American girl, it's not, it's not like cosplaying something that's completely animated and doesn't have to obey the laws of physics in the real world. Yeah, I was actually looking into maybe doing a Molly, uh, and then I realized that I would be wearing it to Dragon Con, which is in Georgia at, at Labor Day, and that she wears a sweater and a vest, and it's all heavy knits, and I was like, it, no, I would be liquid. It'd be warm. Skirt Air. and tights, probably, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, nope. Can't do you it. Need to do the, you need to do the Molly Camp outfit with the cute little shorts. Yes. And the that would work for Georgia. Yeah. Molly's camp book was all, always one of my favorites anyways. So It's so cute and sporty. I was just looking through the catalog um, and I came across Nanea's outfit. And she's um, Hawaii in the early 1940s. And just the style alone with the high-waisted shorts and like the Hawaiian shirt tucked in, the button-down shirt tucked in. I was like, this is so cute. Yeah, like, where can I find adorable. these shorts for myself? I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I could totally cosplay Nanea and it would be comfortable and adorable. So, and it's tropical. She lived in Hawaii, so you know it would Yep. transition really well to to Atlanta in the summer <laughs> so no um what got and Terry I'm gonna open this to you as well what got you into American Girl when you were when you were eight twelve elementary school middle school age so I always came at it because I loved the clothes um my I don't remember how I was introduced to it that it was that long ago but I always loved the clothing. And so my my first American Girl experience was that I really loved the clothing that Kirsten wore. Um, and parts of my family are from Minnesota, which is where her family immigrated to. Mm. Um, and so I had that kind of, you know, when you're a little kid, anything that is even slightly familiar, you kind of latch onto. Um, so that was my, my kind of gateway drug to American Girl. And you know, looking back, it was really cool because those the books dealt with some heavy issues. Like in the first mm -hmm. book, her best friend dies. Like oh, they're not pulling any punches here. So it was a really kind of interesting intro to history in an approachable way. And like now I do living history with museums. So you can like directly trace that in my background um, to the, you know, the had the fascination with the clothes and now I'm doing stuff about material culture so it's pretty cool for me I remember it always being a presence in our household because I think my um my oldest sister who's about eight years older than me she was the one who initially got into it 
So the books were just always around the house. She already had a couple of the dolls. And my mom was very brilliant in that. So we were homeschooled. And so for us as an incentive to read and to learn about history, um, she would bribe us with the doll. So if we read through all of the books and we got to know all of the characters, we got to then pick our favorite. And then we got the doll at the end of it. So I read through, I think it was eight of the dolls had been out at that point. So I read through all of those and then got to choose which one that I wanted to have. That's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah. It was. It was a very good deal. <laughs> I think for me, I um, I had like some children's books that were more medieval historical fiction. Um, and those had interested, like interested me pretty early on. But then my, I think, my friend that was in Girl Scouts with me or something, she, her name was Sammy and she got the Samantha doll and I was intrigued and uh, then read all of the books, didn't get a doll because my parents were like, no, that's, you have too many toys already. Let's play with something you already have. But, you know, it wasn't going to stop me from reading the books because it was so fascinating to, like you say, like, see so much relatable content in a historical setting and like you know with molly's story and wartime like just starts making you think about bigger picture issues as a child yeah at an age where you're often very focused on your immediate sphere of influence right so like i know a friend of mine has like a seven seven and eight year old kid and like like they're not aware of what's going on out around them. You've got like this little bubble and what's inside the bubble is what exists. And so to have a book or a series that makes you step outside of that and like help develop this empathy for like big things that people go through, you know, your dad is going away to war, your best friend dies of cholera, like just things that never would have occurred to me at that age being introduced in such an engaging way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I know, especially like when I would learn history more formally or we would go to different historical sites or things, my mom would definitely relate it back to the books. And that was a really good touchstone and connection point for me where I'm like, okay, this story has a physical um, touchstone to it. And it helped me connect all of those dots historically. Yeah, it definitely um, increased my interest in history. Like, I don't think that I would have been as much of a history nerd as I am now uh, if it hadn't been for these books. Yeah, I think I was such a voracious reader that it was anything from the started, you know, juvenile shelf of what is interesting and what looks good. And I can't remember kind of what started. I was a big Laura Ingalls Wilder fan as well. Yep, and that's so good to me too. <laughs> Yeah, it's just what what can I grab off the shelf that is in inter interest to me, and I think because there were so many of the books, it wasn't like you know just one book and then I, it's over. It kind of continued and kept going, and that's why I liked about the six books is you get kind of a full story. Um, and Addie was um, my first foray into American Girl, I think. And you get such a different sense of history because it's a first person's, um, it's, a, it's a girl, first of all, it's a child, second of all, and then it's first person. So you're living it with her. It's not the pages of a textbook just giving you the facts about the broader aspect of history, but really a first person account of what is happening and what they're going through. Um, and you get the emotions behind it, you know, um, Addie escaping with her mother, um, Molly having to have her dad go away to the war and um, God, Kristen having to blend two cultures together of her Scandinavian, Scottish, I cannot she remember. She was Swedish, yeah. Swedish, okay. Um, yeah, not Scottish. Her Swedish side <laughs> <laughs> mixed with the American of the day and um going to school and and all of that so yeah it's it was american girl does it so well and then even as the books have continued 
into different time periods. And even though it's a different time period, they do such a good job with each girl being different. It's not just the same girl, but in a different time period, they all have different dreams, different ideas and different hopes and dreams out of life as well. Um, So um, have any, have any of you read into any of the newer books or um, the, the kind of girl of the year things? Um, I, I have not. My accomplishment was that I found the all six Josefina books in Spanish. So my goal is to work through those. Um, oh, nice. So that was, that was pretty exciting because a big thing for, you know, for me as a Mexican American child was like, oh my gosh, there's a doll that looks like me. Um, and at the time I did not speak Spanish, but how many little Latina girls are out there now with, you know, they speak Spanish in the home and they can have that then in like the language of their heart. And I, I think that's really cool. So that's, that's my goal is to work through those. So they're not, they're not the new girls, but it's a new experience. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. Um, Katie and Rachel, what are your favorite dolls or time periods that are different from the girls that you cosplay? Go ahead, Rachel. I think that's a really hard choice, honestly, (laughs) because I loved so many different aspects of so many of them. So like Samantha with the industrial revolution and the Edwardian aesthetic was just stunning. And then Kit, I think Kit is the one that almost everybody wanted to be like, she had the coolest tree house and she had the typewriter and wanted to be the writer. Um, Josefina, like I, I absolutely was entranced by her story and learning about her culture and her family dynamic. I, it, it's so hard for me to pick. Yeah, so I actually, I have obviously some Josefina clothing that I've made for myself, but I also dress in mid 19th century clothing, not to, not to cosplay Kirsten, but for, you know, museum sites and that sort of thing. Um, and I also have worn 18th century clothing, so that's Felicity. Um, (laughs) so, uh, I guess outside of what I've already, you know, dressed in, I would probably have to say Samantha, um, because that one is, you know, a little bit later than the stuff that I've done. It's the early 19th century or no, early 20th century, um, late 19th century. Um, and the, the industrial revolution and like the child labor, um, like her, her bestie was working in a factory, right? Like that's some important stuff. And we still have stuff like that going on globally um, today. Like, you know, the clothes we wear are made by children in other countries. So it's a, it, it's one of those things, again, American Girl is dealing with hard stuff and it's still relevant today. Um, and so that would be an interesting way to kind of touch that through history. Um, and any time that I can, you know, tie it back to some sort of awareness of bigger issues is important to me. And I, I do think part of that comes from having grown up with American Girl because all of the books, all of the series dealt with difficult topics. And that's something that I, you know, the more I learn as an adult, the more I find that valuable in the, the children's literature. Like, oh, yeah it helped me be able to deal with hard things now. Especially because like it sort of prepares you that like not everything is sunshine and rainbows, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah, like, I mean, Josefina's story opens and her mom already died. Like they're in, they're, you, you visit them in the grieving process for their mother. And that's a huge part of the story right? Well, last year my grandpa died and I'm recognizing all of those steps of grief from those stories and the ways that they remembered their mother in the sorts of things that my family and I are doing to remember my grandfather. And so it's really, really intimate and immediate in a lot of ways and super valuable to be able to have that from a young age. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was just thinking Courtney, the newest historical uh, 
girl that just came out, um, she's in a blended family. So she has um, a step parent and some step siblings and she's set in the eighties. And it's kind of something that I don't think any of the other American girls had, but it's something that kids today have very prevalently. Oh yeah. And like, that wasn't, like I, I remember some of the eighties, like I was little, but I remember it. And like the, there was a Mr. Rogers episode that didn't air because it talked about divorce and it was too upsetting to test audiences. Right. So having something that deals with blended families and step parents, step children, and the situation that, you know, kids have no, no agency in that sort of situation. So the, to find yourself in that situation and to have a story that you can relate to and be like, it's okay. It's okay. This girl is living through the same thing and you know, it's, it's going to be all right. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's, it's really important too, because um, you know, definitely like it's enduring, like growing up and experiencing a lot of the themes and things from the books, but even more so reaching to kids and not pretending like hard things don't happen to children. Hard yep. things happen to children all the time. And so instead of trying to romanticize it or ignore that, it shows ways to deal with it and shows other people that children can relate to in those situations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It doesn't tell you, oh, your feelings don't matter. Oh, this doesn't matter. Just hide it away. It shows you, yeah, how to deal, how to process and kind of what can come out from the other side too because you can read the stories and they have a conclusion already. So even if you're in the middle of it, you know that things will get better. You know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. And in addition, I think that it also personalizes history quite a bit as well. It gives you a lot more empathy for historical figures, for historical uh, events, that sort of a thing. Because it's like, oh no, those weren't just people on pages of a book. Those were living, breathing, emotional beings. Yeah, and that's something that through doing studies of material culture and doing living history, and my grandpa was a genealogist and, you know, there's our multiple, not like valuable family heirlooms, but like things that people in our ancestry made that have been passed down. And every so often there's this little gem of I would have gotten along with this person. Like they were funny or they were, you know, strong or serious or silly or, you know, just things like that where people have always been people. And so to have an entire series of books that makes them so relatable is a really a really great gateway to relating on a personal level to the past. And like every time I find one of those, you know, little gems in the family history, I'm like, I wish I could have a drink with this person, right? Like they're just like the, what they've written or the thing that they made or the craft that they did that I have in my hands now, it, it speaks of who they were. And it, I think, honestly, I think my intro to history being at such a young age and so relatable makes me more open to that idea as opposed to having just learned it in school or whatever. I almost think it helps to um, girls relate to older generations, you know, yeah, my grandmother absolutely. isn't just the person with gray hair that gives me cookies and hugs. Like she had a life similar to mine when she was my age and kind of allows the connection, even from current relatives instead of just ancestors in the past. So absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when, um, Julie came out even, and, um, just even seeing her merchandise in the store and stuff. And I would go with my mom and I'd be like, is this what it was like when you were my age, you know? And she'd be like, yeah, there was Tang and we drank Tang and those were shoes and bell bottoms that I wore. And that was yeah, the now there's, now there's Courtney and all of the elder millennials were like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody came like, out and I was like, the eighties are not historical. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> Um, oh, that was that was a hard one to swallow. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, ladies, this has been a great conversation. Can you share your social media handles so that we can see more of your cosplays, more of your historical conversations that we can get out there and people can 
can see what you're doing. Yeah, um, I am Latina Living History on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I'm Needles and Nerds on Instagram and YouTube. Not a whole lot of content on YouTube right now, but um, I do have a couple Felicity videos up there. Wonderful. All right. Well, we had the pleasure of chatting with an editor and an author with American Girl about the newest historical doll, Courtney. So here's our conversation. Joining us today is Jennifer Hirsch, one of the executive editors of American Girl, and Kellen Hertz, the author of the new Courtney Moore books, Changes the Game and Friendship Superhero. I'm Allison Helfrich, and I have Terry with me as well. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. So before I get into some questions, can you just give us a little bit of background, um, how long you've been with American Girl, um, what your role is, kind of how you got started? Sure. I have been with American Girl since 1995. Um, I started out as a copy editor and uh, moved into developing developmental editing um, and have since then developed multiple characters for American Girl, both historical characters as well as some Girl of the Year and Welly Wishers, for those of you who are familiar with the Smaller Doll series. And, um, and that's what I do. I When we start a new character, I find the author, um, hire the advisors, and then work closely with the product designers to create a world and a story. And um, it's a lot of fun. That's wonderful. And I met Jennifer about, gosh, I think eight years ago now. Sounds about right. Um, yeah. And uh, they were looking for a writer to help out on one of the books for Girl of the Year. Um, and I... I helped out on one of those books and then they liked what I did and they asked me to write the Tenny books. So I became the author, the name author on the Tenny books. And then I just did Courtney who came out this year, the latest historical character, which was not so historical to me because I grew up in, in the eighties, but <laughs> that's why you did uh, it was such a uh, great job. <laughs> yeah, it was a thrill. It was a thrill to revisit my childhood in the Courtney books. And Kellen's I, being modest, I'm going to add that she is also a script writer, and I first fell in love with her writing when I read one of her scripts about, um, I think it was, it was it Queen Elizabeth or yes. <laughs> something? Yes. Yeah. And, about and Queen Elizabeth. Like, yes. And I was, we, we got we to gotta get her in here to, to do a novel for us. And she has now wonderful. done five or yeah, six it was, for us. Yeah. Seven. I think I've done seven, seven. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's been super, super, super rewarding um I started writing as a in tv and film and I still do tv stuff but this has been just much more rewarding in terms of um being able to like really feel like you're reaching an audience that mm -hmm. is so interested and engaged and they're just like sponges and they want to soak everything up and so you feel like you're you're really playing an active role in helping girls you know, figure out who they are and who they want to be. I think one of the great things about American Girl is they pull girls not just from all times, but different life experiences and different situations. You know, each each girl, each story isn't identical and just set in a different time period. Right. They're each unique and specific to themselves. And Kellen, you're right, girls can see themselves in and amongst those different characters. Yeah, one, one of the founders' goals was to show that even though different time periods bring really different challenges and different life situations, um, different opportunities, there are some things that are constant throughout history. Girls still want friends. They still need to develop confidence. They're trying to understand their role in the world. Um, that doesn't change. Yeah, and we've mentioned ourselves and with our colleagues that these are books around girls. And that isn't common, especially in that age range. You always get young boys and to give girls that confidence and girls that maybe idea that they can go do something or, or see themselves doing something they hadn't experienced before really. You know, I think, them. yeah, I think when we were all growing up that that was mostly true. I mean, there were, there were the exceptions, but that was the rule. And 
I think it's really changed. And I like to think American Girl had something to do with that, that, that uh, this company has shown that girls as protagonists and heroes um, make a lot of sense and they, you know, that, that it shouldn't just, they're not sort of the, um, the sidebar to boy adventures that, that in there, you know, there's just a lot more TV shows and cable shows and everything that, that feature girls. Um, and I, I think that's all been pretty recent, like in the last 15, 20 years. And as I say, I'd like to think that American Girl had something to do with that. I definitely think so. Those girls that read American Girl, became script writers and, and ideas. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Jennifer, you kind of curate everything from start to finish. You come up with the ideas of the characters and then move forward from there? Um, it's very collaborative. Uh, our first step, every year, American Girl surveys girls and moms, and it's a statistically, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about between 500 and 1,000 girls and moms. Um, we ask many of the same questions over and over, but we do add new ones. We want to know what they're, what they're interested in, what they're concerned about, what they love, what they don't love. And, and we track trends as well as, you know, tracking, oh, what new issues are bubbling up, like a lot more concern about the environment or active shooters in school, you know, active shooter training in schools or just whatever might be, you know, how to label the restrooms in school, you know, whatever kind of issues are trending, interests, um, but some things are perennial, like girls always love animals. Um, they always love dance, you know, so, mm -hmm. So we track these things and then that informs the characters we develop. Um, but for example, take animals. We know they love animals. We don't wanna do animals every single year. But uh, when we were developing Kira, the 2021 girl of the year, we thought, you know, it's been a few years since we've done an animal girl, um, but how can we do it differently? How can, we, how can we give a fresh story and a different world than any we've created before? Because a lot of our characters have animals. Um, so. That's when, and we knew girls love travel. And of course, most of the development was pre pandemic. So we had really didn't know that travel was going to shut down. Um, but we, so we said, how about Australia? You know, why not Australia? That's a very aspirational place for her to go. Um, so, so we come up together. And when I say we, it's myself, it's a research, uh, some research staff, and then the product designers. So these are the people who create the look of the doll and all her accessories. It's very, it's completely collaborative. Um, and I might say, oh, you know, that would be a really great setting for certain themes, like an environmental theme in set in Australia. And they would say, oh, some really great opportunities for unique animals that we've never done before. Instead of the usual dogs and cats, we can do koalas and kangaroos. And so that's how we look at it. Sometimes we, when we're, especially with historical periods, um, we have a, a mismatch. So uh, for a long time, many customers were saying, well, why don't you have a pilgrim doll? And, and I felt, yeah, like we should have a doll, you know, maybe Dutch, New York, 1600s. Like, why aren't we doing this? And the product designers said she would have one black dress. That's it. And, <laughs> you know, so just not too much opportunity there. So, not so we we try to we try to look for something that's going to be exciting both thematically and from a storytelling perspective as well as have opportunity for really fun toys you know because that's that's what we sell toys mm -hmm. as well as books yeah. um kellen can you talk a little bit about the courtney books your process sure sure um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it's you funny. said you went to the 80s. Did you draw from your own life yes, for a lot deeply, of this? <laughs> deeply, deeply. I mean, it's funny. I think Jennifer's uh, being modest in some ways, like in terms of uh, when she, when I ever American Girl comes to me, I never feel like uh, they're telling me what I need to write or what is on the agenda. It's really often with Courtney, we know she's a gamer. And we know she lives in the 80s. Go. <laughs> like, that's pretty much it. And we think maybe California. And I was like, that's great. I grew up in California. So, and I grew up in Fresno, California, which is a part of California that's not often depicted on, <laughs> on uh, a mainstream TV. It's not what people think of when they think of California. Um, so I wanted to do a kind of suburban um, look at, 
you know, my own childhood definitely um, in terms of influences. I mean, I knew right away, I, I'm, a, I'm also a massive history buff. I hadn't written history before uh, these books in terms of novels, but I'm, I do a lot of research and have written a lot of historical stuff in the past. Um, for this, it was more like, what are the thing, looking at sort of the classic American girl books and thinking, what do I love about Melody? What do I love about Kit? And to me, it was always about how they integrated, the, the best of them integrated these, a, a really um, accurate educational view of history with a very deeply emotional story. And so that was really like what I wanted to do with Courtney. Um, so I thought about like in my own childhood, what were the big historical moments that I remembered, you know, and for me, it was, you know, Challenger, it was 1984 Olympics, it was, um, it was HIV. So those were some of the big things that I remember um, grappling with and thinking about and talking to my parents about, and, you know, there were other things too, Reagan and stuff like that, but that was sort of I was going for the more universal experience. And of course, pop culture and all of that, which is so much fun. Mall. And was sort of the every- mall. <laughs> and the mall. Yeah, the mall was everything. The mall was everything, like all of that. But it was, that was sort of, I knew we were going to talk about that stuff. I wanted to make sure that there was a balance between um, the fun, boppy, Cindy Lauper side of the 80s and the side of the 80s that I remember which was a little bit uncertain a little bit polarized um politically polarized and also because I think also because I felt like that's where we are now like we as a culture are kind of polarized and we feel like there's it's an us and them sort of thing and I I I really felt that growing up in the 80s and I didn't feel that so much in the 90s and the aughts I felt like there, it was a much less so mm-hmm. for, and that again, something that I love about other American Girl books is when I'm reading a book and I feel like, okay, it's Melody in the 1960s in Detroit, but there are so many issues about the, you know, she goes into the shop and, and the, 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 the storekeeper is eyeing her and one, you know, thinks she's a shoplifter. And that's a scene that could happen today to a kid. Um, because of the way they look and so for, so letting your reader experience those scenes even though they and writing the scenes in a way that make them feel universal at the same time that they're historically accurate was something mm-hmm. that I was really thought was important yeah and that that is what we aim for um right why we love yes Kelly but writer. I did uh, <laughs> but I did draw a lot on my childhood I mean I grew up in 120 degree heat every summer I spent the whole summer in the mall because it was so friggin' hot. Or I was in my pool, the you know, backyard pool or my friend's backyard pool and, you know, picking fruit from trees that were in our backyard, which, you know, I didn't realize was like so novel until I left California and everyone was like, what are you talking about? You have fruit in your backyard. Um, and you know, going to the going to the mall, going to the arcade, and then going to the movie theater, and then going back to the arcade, and then going to hot dog on a stick, and then going and trying on clothes at the gap, and being like, my mom will never let me buy this because I don't have enough money. You know, all of those things were like kind of swirling in my head. Um, bad perms. I mean, that was really big. I was like, we we need to do a bad perm because I got a really bad perm in the eighties, <laughs> and. Uh, and then, and then that turned into, oh, what about when you get your ears pierced? And we realized, oh, American Girl hasn't actually done an ear piercing scene, yes. which right. we couldn't believe. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, a bad that... perm scene in Molly, but no, yeah, for yeah. <laughs> the first ear piercing scene. Yeah, the ear piercing, and so of course I got my ears pierced when I was twelve. So it was, you know, there was a lot of walks down memory lane. And I mean, the biggest one was I, when I was in sixth grade, I watched a Challenger explode with my entire class. So that was like super formative in a horrible way experience, but also, uh, you know, a, like a, almost like a turning point between being a young child and being a child that was like thinking about grappling with more um, deep, deeper issues like death. And um, so I, th- I felt really strongly that that was something that we should use as a touchstone. And, and that's great. And that's what we look to our authors to bring to the stories because 
every character, one thing they all have in common is they all have an arc through their series where they start out very concerned about sort of smaller girl level personal issues. It could be a friendship issue. It could be a family issue. It could be, what am I going to wear for Halloween? I mean, it, it, it's small and close to home and, and it's very real to a girl. I don't, I don't mean to say it's trivial or unimportant, but it's, it's very much sort of under her roof. And by the end of the series, all our characters are contemplating bigger issues. They, they have grown by coming aw more aware of the world around them and their impact that they can actually impact the world around them. And whether that's their community or, you know, in Kira's case, uh, an entire area of Australia that's being hurt by fires or, you know, but, the, but they're thinking bigger than just their own personal experience. And that's part of growing up. And so that's something that we try to bring to every story. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, now, when Terry and I were reading American Girl, checking them out from the library in droves um, in elementary school and middle school, there were six books per mm -hmm. doll, per girl. Um, it seems the shift has come. I know Courtney has two books. Are mm -hmm. there any more coming? Or is it kind of going to stay shorter for, yeah, well, for the new girls? Uh, so that there's sort of a two part answer to that. And I'll answer the second part first as to whether there will be more stories. Um, never say never. But right now there's not a specific plan in place to have more Courtney stories, but there could there could be in the future. We've done short stories. We've done mysteries and choose your own ending kind of spinoffs. So any of those could happen for Courtney. Uh, there are also other formats that we we create content in on YouTube. Uh, Courtney does already have some YouTube sort of doll stop motion videos. They're really cute. Um, They're super and, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so there is other content, um, but I think I think another part of your question is why did we go from having six titles per character to two? And that there's sort of a business reason for that. Um, when we first started the company, I say we, when I wasn't with it for the first <laughs> nine years, but when the company was first started, um, each character had, had the six titles, you know, meet Felicity, Felicity learns a lesson, Felicity surprise, and so on. And as we got more characters after a while, um, sort of in the early to mid two thousands, we started finding that sales of the later titles fell off a cliff because booksellers were not willing to stock so many titles. It's as simple as that. They would order the first two, maybe three titles of some of the more popular characters. They would not carry all six. They just wouldn't. Oh and yeah, and and so we thought, okay, um, we it's important to us to get these, you know, the full arc of the story in front of our readers and fans. We don't want them to just sort of be stuck at the lesson book, you know, and have that. And yes, you can order online, but often, especially with kids books, you know, it's, it's an off the shelf kind of purchase. And so we decided to rejigger the stories so that they were in two volumes. And so if now, if you do go to AmericanGirl.com and you, and you want to order books about Melody or Nenea or Julie or Kit or whoever, um, you're only going to find two titles with them. You're not going to be able to buy the whole six books. You can get them on, on eBay and other places, you know, used booksellers. But if you want to get their stories now, they're just, you'll just, even the older characters, you will find them in two books. So you've basically taken the, the six Yep. three and three and then yes. two books yes okay because exactly. in my head I was thinking they're getting chipped they're not getting the full story but yeah. they're a little bit yeah. longer and it's just three books and three exactly books. exactly really yep I'm gonna um, ask the awkward question oh sorry Terry did you have a question so, uh I was just going to say that I do remember like as a child trying to find later books and series and it just being very frustrated when like because you know we would always go to the library for these because right I was such an avid consumer Aww. and it was very reader an avid reader reader mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> which is also a consumer but you know 
<laughs> yeah, it, it became it just became the easiest, best solution. And, and it was a good deal for the for the customer, because then in the box with the doll, when you get the first book, you're getting more story, you're getting more of her story. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I we recently reread some of the historical novels, got them out of the library, gotta love New York Public Library. Um, and I had forgotten that the back of the books really had historical aspects of that time. Yeah. And it was fascinating as an adult rereading through this stuff and just relearning things that I'd either forgotten or completely, I, honestly, I, that part has been blanched from my memory. I didn't realize it was ever in there. And so you it probably it thought so it was boring when you were a kid. <laughs> maybe. Is that in the Courtney books and in, in the newer books as well? Oh, that's, so do you do it more like where you've broken them up or is it kind of only at the end of each of the books? It's a, well, okay. So for the books where we had six books and they were sort of composited into two, they're not going to have they're not, they're not going to have the full, what we call the looking back essay. We didn't take all three looking back essays and just string them together. We, we merged them in a shorter so that, so the looking back essay is, is somewhat shorter, but we do try to touch on all the topics that are in the book because okay. a big part of the sort of mission, if you will, is, is to help girls put together, okay, this story's fiction, but it's very much grounded and based on the reality of girls and families lives back in this era and and we want you to understand sort of the real issues that that they were facing and so often there are real people who are inspiration for example in courtney's book um book two talk, does talk about hiv and um uh, Courtney's friend who's HIV positive was based very much on, on Ryan White. Um, if you know that story, it was big in the 1980s, who was a boy who got yes. HIV from a blood transfusion. And um, I think uh, Kellen could tell you a little more about that, but, but we talk about that in the, in the looking back that, you know, again, Courtney's story is fiction, but here's who it was based on. And yeah. I don't mean based on in the sense that it's biographical, but inspired by Yes, he was deeply inspired. I mean, Isaac, the character in the second book, was deeply inspired by, by Ryan White, who obviously I never met, but like, was someone I tracked very closely when I was his that age because he was he was only a few years older than me, and um, he did uh, a lot to destigmatize uh, AIDS victims and and H those who had HIV for kids, especially I think. And um, I also really was interested, and this is like a more, more of a contemporary idea, but I was interested in the idea of allyship and like her being an ally to someone. And how do you, <clears throat> how do you become an ally to someone without taking space, you know, be, taking, taking ownership of their, their thing. And uh, it just really, it just all really made sense because he was a gamer like her, which mm -hmm. made sense because she's a, kind of a girl in a boy's world in the 80s there's not as many gamers that are girls and so I wanted to sort of deal with all of those things at this at the same time but at this but it really at the heart of it it came down to that something that Ryan White was somebody that I uh made a big impression on me as a kid so yeah and I love that too that you wanted to focus on allyship because it's a big part of what kids are living in right now too so yes how do I support this person without taking ownership, taking over it, making it about me. So. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that is yeah. some, something that we also consciously try to do when we're, we're developing these stories and working with authors. If, if something bubbles up that is highly relevant to today, um, well, even not, I mean, it wasn't just Ryan White, but it was I mean, when, when Kellen started writing the Courtney series, there was no pandemic, but it was insane. Through, things changed. We were in, yeah, yeah I mean, we were in final edits on the, we were fi in final edits on book two and, uh, and the pandemic happened. And it was sort of like, well, this is very odd. Yeah, <laughs> because but very relevant. Is, but very <laughs> relevant. It made the story much more relevant. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was still relevant. I think it was still about, I think things in, in the culture were still swirling and talking again, allyship, things like that. But but obviously like fear of illness was not something that 
before was February or March of, of <laughs> right, was the top of our mind. So, yeah. but, so it was definitely, but, but, uh, you know, it was, it was very odd to, to have that happen, but um, I'm glad it made the book more relevant because I feel yeah. like kids could read it and, you know, yeah. grapple with the idea that like, you know, what happens when there's something out there that people are afraid of getting and mm -hmm. how you deal with that fear. Yeah. Kira too. Um, so when we were sort of in the midst of developing her second book with, with Aaron Teagan, the author, uh, she said, we realized, oh my gosh, Australia is on fire and we can't not talk about this. Like this has to become not just a background, but an essential part of our story because it was all about an animal sanctuary and animals were dying and, you know, sanctuaries were being evacuated. And we just realized it, it would just be sort of irresponsible to, to ignore that and pretend that that wasn't happening. Um, so even though these are fiction, we we want them to be not only grounded in reality, but relevant. And this is really relevant. You know, pe people were, I don't know if you, you remember, but, or if you were aware, but people all over the world were sending these pouches to Australia to be used for orphan baby kangaroos and other marsupials. They needed pouches. And um, so th this, this was an ongoing news story for quite a while until the pandemic hit. <laughs> and suddenly they switched to making masks. Mm -hmm. but, um, but so we sort of shifted the focus of book two to bring, you know, we thought we, we've got to include this. And um, Erin Teagan had the idea uh, and she was already toying with this. She wanted it to be about science and how you do science honestly and do it right. And even though it was it was not science of a pandemic, it was still about science and about falsifying evidence or ignoring evidence. It was just so timely. So we kind of put a spotlight on that as well. You guys have a crystal ball somewhere? I don't know. I don't know. We just, we're very, we have antenna. Oh, we weird. <laughs> the fortuitousness yeah. of it. Yeah, a very just... refined antenna um, <laughs> that, you know, it's like when something, something happens, we look for the parallels and, and we find them. <laughs> that is great. And I know your, your current books, while I haven't read them about girls in society today, they mm -hmm. grapple with, with different um, different things that they'll come across, you know, whether it's a disability or, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's one of your girls has, um, a hearing, um, yeah, that was girl of, the, and, girl of the year 2020 was Joss Kendrick, um, who, yeah, she, she was, uh, partially deaf. So she had partial hearing in one ear and complete deafness in another ear. And it, it wasn't the focus of her story in the sense that her story was not about, you know, overcoming a challenge. It, her story was about, I mean, she had challenges, but they had to do with, with she was a surfer and her brother dared her to try out for the cheer, a competitive cheer team. And she sort of did it on a lark and she made the team because she was a good athlete. And at first she was sort of disdainful, but then she decided, hey, this is actually kind of cool. And when I'm surfing, it's a solo sport and it's kind of a man's world. And there's a lot of trash talk and nobody's really supporting me in a cheer team. You are part of a team and it's pretty awesome. But it's true that her, deaf, her deafness did pose some challenges because the gym is very noisy and unlike on a surfboard when she could be in her own world she could just take out her hearing aids she didn't need them when she's on the waves um, and she didn't want them to get wet um, in the gym she had to use them because she had to hear the count and respond to her teammates so the deafness was an integral part of the story but the focus of the story was on her uh, growth as an athlete it wasn't on you know it, it wasn't on disability as a disability per se. Which and is part of who that's she was. my point, which is perfect. Yeah. You're saying this is a human and these are yeah. the challenges they have as a human. They yeah. just, or just happen the to qualities. be different. Yeah, just yeah. the qualities they have. It's just one of her qualities. You know, she has red yeah. hair and partial deafness and she's a great athlete. And, you know, so it's yeah. wasn't even really like a disability exactly. In some ways, it actually helped her because when she would take out her hearing aids, she had total focus. So that was really helpful as a surfer to her. It was actually an advantage, no distractions. Um, it's, so, yeah. yeah, it helps show kids, you know, a, no, you know, kids that don't have um, a disability or a difference and kids that do of, 
oh, they're just like me. And like, oh, look, I can be the hero of the story mm -hmm. also. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's right. American Girl does it brilliantly. You yeah. guys are <laughs> definitely one of a kind in that respect. So well, a yeah, big part of that is finding finding the right authors and um, finding like for so for Kira, we wanted an author who could write really well about science because we knew that was going to be a feature. And, and we actually used Erin Teagan, who had also done the Luciana Girl of the Year books for us about a girl who was really into astronomy. And then for Courtney, we had already, of course, worked with Kellen on, a, on the Tenny books and a Leah book. And so we just knew she would be perfect <laughs> having grown up in the 80s and in Southern California. So yeah, a big part of it is finding an author. We're not necessarily looking for somebody who's an expert in the area, but we want them to have an affinity for it so that they can just bring that heart and that voice and, and those unique insights that, that really can't be taught. You know, you, you, it's got to come from somewhere kind of deep. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. You both have been wonderful. I truly appreciate it. I have one last question for each of you. And Terry and I are also going to give our answers, put you on the spot. What is your favorite historical American girl? Jennifer? Yeah. So I, I am going to go with the two that I developed first. And that was uh, Julie Albright, who's growing up in San Francisco in the 1970s. The author is Megan McDonald, who's also famous for having written the Judy Moody books. And Megan and I are both exactly the same age. We both kind of came of age in this, you know, grew up in the 1970s. And I did grow up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I actually lived in Berkeley, not, not San Francisco. But um, so love Julie, uh, incredible experience working with Megan. And then Rebecca Rubin, who is um, of Russian Jewish descent uh, from an immigrant, her parents were immigrants uh, growing up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1914. And that was very much like my grandmother's story on my father's side, they're all Russian Jewish. So um, just with both Rebecca and Julie, I feel a lot of affinity with them and it was an amazing experience developing them I like Alan? Kit I like Kit because I've wanted to be a writer since I was you know 12 and she wants to be a writer so that was she's the she's my main American girl I also really love Melody though um Melody is very different than me and her family is very different than my family but I think I think that in reading those books that you know, part of, of great fiction that really works is that it transports you and it makes you feel like you're experiencing re really living somebody else's experience. Um, and when I read those books, I absolutely felt that. Um, so I would say it's a tie <laughs> between those two. That's great. That's great. Terry, what about you? Uh, <clears throat> Oh. Kirsten or Molly? Kirsten or Molly? Yeah, uh, because with Kirsten, uh, she was, I think, the first one that I read. And there was a lot of things that I had never thought about in the American experience of that era that I just, it was a culture shock and I loved it. And I think with Molly, it was a little bit of that as well, because she is a wartime story. Mm -hmm. And that sort of really like deepened my perspective on like what people went through during that period. Well, if, if I may, I will encourage you to pick up Nanea's books. She's also the 1940s and she's growing up in the early 1940s, 1941 to be specific in Honolulu. So, you know, it happens to her. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Allison? Mine were Felicity and Addie. I think I read Addie first and Harriet Tubman was the person I always wanted to do a book report about. And it may have stemmed from from my reading of Addie. The Harriet Tubman was like, she was my girl. I was like, oh, a book report, Harriet Tubman. You need a historical person, Harriet Tubman. I was like, for four years straight, it was great. Um, and Felicity, because I was kind of obsessed with the American Revolution. And I loved that time period, the 1776. And 
the Col Colonial Williamsburg, um, my family and I went to Colonial Williamsburg just a couple of years ago. And oh. in reopening Felicity, I went, this is set in Colonial Williamsburg. I've literally walked to these streets and that was surreal. Yeah. So that was really fun. But yeah, definitely those two. Well, did you know that Colonial Williamsburg was actually the inspiration, the original inspiration for the whole company? <gasps> really? Oh. Yeah, yeah the, fo the founder was... Um, was there and she just looked around and she felt that it could be so inspiring for girls, but it wasn't, it sort of wasn't really serving kids, at least at that time, it, it was more of an adult experience and it is an amazing adult experience, as you know. Um, but she thought, what if we could sort of take like the qualities, you know, the, the, the realism of this historical experience and sort of bring it down to girl size, you know, with outfit, like have a doll who's the girl and then outfits and the accessories and stories about growing up in that time. And then she could play with them and kind of bring it to life that way. And so it really was, was Colonial Williamsburg that, that gave her that um, insight. <laughs> That's, oh. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, makes she, it even more special. Yeah, she, she was actually there on a visit. This is very famous American Girl lore. She was visiting and she wrote to her dear friend, Valerie Tripp. This is Pleasant Roland, founder of um, American Girl, formerly called Pleasant Company. And she wrote to Valerie Tripp um, a letter and said, I'm sitting here looking around and I suddenly had this vision, you know, this idea, what if, and then, you know, she kind of, played it all out and she even sketched the girl on a napkin and um, and sent it to Valerie Tripp who she had worked with at an educational uh, publisher, Addison Wesley um, back in, I guess the seventies. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's how it started. Oh my gosh. Love it. Love it. Trivia. Give it to me all. <laughs> Jennifer and Helen, thank you so very much. It's been such a pleasure. Truly yeah. appreciate your time, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.